Hi everybody, so yesterday I've posted a quiz on the LinkedIn uh, inductance quiz and it was about we have a straight uh, we have a wire of copper which is 38 centimeters long with a diameter of one millimeter and the wire is arranged in, in different uh, setups which of the setup has the highest inductance and which one the lowest one sort these different setups that you see on the slide in terms of inductance and I think it wasn't that simple. It required a bunch of answers till people got it right. And what I want to do today, I want to explain how uh, you can guess the right inductance of the different setups. But before talking about the different setups, let's talk about inductance first, because often I see that inductance is often named like it's the term that uh, resists the current uh, resists a circuit to carry a current. And I actually like much more to see the inductance in terms of the magnetic field energy. So the inductance itself is like the proportionality factor of your setup. Uh, how much magnetic field energy can be stored in, in the given setup if we keep the current constant. So. Um, I think it's a much, for me, it's a much more straightforward way because um, the current and the magnetic field, they, they are proportional to each other in terms of when you think about the Maxwell equations, like the curl of the magnetic field equals the current. So that means the more magnetic field energy can be stored inside the setup, the higher the inductance needs to be. And then you don't need to think like the current is resisting something. So when you think like you're connecting a source to, to a conductor, the first thing what happens is that the magnetic field is built up and proportional to the magnetic field also the current. So it just requires your source some certain energy to build up the magnetic field. And that's why it takes longer uh, to build up the current. So you don't need to think like there is some, some opposite force. Just think like, I can store a certain amount of energy inside the inside the conductor and this energy is stored in the magnetic field and it just takes long or it takes a certain time from for the source to supply this energy so the higher the inductance be the more energy can be stored and the longer it takes to build up the current that's how I like to think about the inductance actually and then when we think about a certain wire uh, a certain wire length you have like a certain amount of magnetic energy which you can store for a, for a unit section of the wire. And that's why a longer wire will store more energy. But in a real arrangement, it will matter how the wire is arranged. And typically, how the so-called loop inductance can be calculated or what is a nice way to think about, it's that you have a, you have a current loop this, which carries the current and this current loop is generating a magnetic flux. You can also think of a magnetic field inside, inside a, a area which is enclosed by the wire. So that's typically how a loop inductance is defined. And for the two setups shown in the beginning, for these two setups, it's sufficient to look at this, uh, at this, um, at this area. So if we now go back to, to our model, and we look when we look about the the area uh, which is enclosed by the wire. So the wire length is the same. So you will have a larger area in the in the quadratic shape because the quadratic shape it, it maximizes the area of the rectangle. And it's like when you look uh, when you calculate the area here, it's it's almost let's say. Uh, more than double the area size of of the small loop and this is also why the inductance of the larger loop so this is the wide loop the inductance of the wide loop is higher than the inductance of the narrow loop but don't be confused by the area because people always have their uh, formula in mind that the area it scales with the area of a wound inductor 
But here for this rectangular setup, it's not scaling with the area like linearly. So, I mean, we have more than double the area, but you can see the inductance is not more than double. And this is the reason is the actually the mutual inductance between the different, like the, the two top wires and the two left and right wires, the mutual inductance between them. And it's much more complicated formula. So that's why it does not scale linearly. And the formula you can actually get from Oh, just Google. If you Google it and you see that the formula for the inductance of a rectangular loop is much more complicated. And that's why also it does not just linearly scale with, with, the, with the area of the loop. And if you look here, so I put in the loop width of, of this rectangular and we get an inductance of 3.48 E minus 7. And that's exactly the inductance I am getting here actually for the AC inductance. So the inductance is a DC and an AC behavior, which is because of the skin depths here. Uh, not going into details about uh, this, but you can see that the, the larger loop area, it, it agrees perfectly to, to the analytical calculation uh, when we look at the AC inductance. So clearly the one with the larger loop area, the rectangle with the larger loop area, will have the, uh, will have the higher inductance. And I have been using a partial inductance solution here. So there is, that's why you see such a small gap. Basically you define a current flowing in here and a current going out here. And uh, this small gap, it doesn't matter that much in the setup because I could at the same time take a full wave solver now where the gap is closed by a port. So I'm not using a partial inductance calculator. Now I'm really calculating the, uh, the full loop inductance. And if you compare this one for the white loop here, so let's take the white loop, the narrow and the white loop. You can see the white loop calculated from the full wave solver converges exactly to the white loop calculated by the partial inductance solver. Just at higher frequency, there is a difference because the partial solution here used a magnetic quasi static approximation. So it did not include the, the capacitance. While the full wave includes the capacitance, you can see that at higher frequencies, they start to deviate because there is a beginning of a, of a resonance, which is not captured by the magnetic phase static solver. That's why there is a difference here. But in this low frequency band, as long as the capacitance doesn't play a role, you can see that the loop and the partial solution of the setup, uh, they agree very well because the, the gap was very, very small. So that's great. Uh, now we could move on after we got the loops, we could talk about the straight wire. And that's now a problem about the partial inductance. So for the straight wire, no loop inductance can exist because we didn't close the loop. So you cannot use uh, the magnetic field uh, integrated over the surface because the surface is, is not present. However, you can use a vector potential um, and by using the vector potential, you can calculate the so-called partial capacitance. Basically, it's the capacitance, con uh, sorry, the partial inductance. It's the inductance contribution of each separated arm of the loop. And that can only be calculated by the vector potential. But people like to do this. And if you apply this approach, you can calculate the, uh, the partial inductance of this of this wire and even if there is no loop this partial inductance it, it, it does uh, converge so you can calculate a value and obviously because the loop is and now it becomes difficult the loop is infinite the loop is large the loop is for sure larger than in the case of the of, of the closed loop simply because you have no mutual inductance so there is no effect of the mutual inductance and this is why the uh, straight wire inductance is higher than the, the partial inductance of the straight wire is higher than the inductances of the loops. And this is an effect of the, of the partial inductance. And it's basically you are calculating the inductance of a non-physical circuit because in, in real physics, you need the loop to make the current flow, but still people use this approach a lot in the industry 
And I think you have to become careful with this approach because people, what they tend to do is they calculate the inductance and then take this inductance calculated from the partial solution and put it on a circuit and continue calculating with this. And that can be a problem if you neglect the mutual capacitance. So if I build two bus bars here, right, each of these bars has, a, has, its own, has its own partial inductance, which is, if we look here, so L bar 1 has a partial uh, inductance and L bar 2 has a partial inductance. They are the same. It's the same wires. But if we now would take just this partial inductances of, of the separated lengths and create a circuit right, to calculate the loop inductance. So you say you, you put a source at the one end, you short at the other end, and you want to see the inductance of the whole loop. If you do this and you include just the two one in series, because that's what it is, the current flows in series. If you put them in series, you will not have the right approximation simply because you have completely forgotten about the coupling between these two. And if we look at the impedance, so no mutual coupling and with the mutual coupling, you can see it's you, you're making a huge error simply because you have neglected this, uh, this mutual inductance terms. So that's important. So one thing, of course, what you can do is you can take the partial RLC solver as we do and extra export the spice because the spice from this, it includes the, uh, it includes the coupling inductance. And you can see we get basically at the higher frequencies we get the same response as in the case where I have, have added the mutual coupling manually. Obviously, at the lower frequencies now, the structure becomes resistive, and this was not included in the two models which I had here, where just inductance were plotted. But uh, yeah, that's the more clearer picture. And also here, like I can use a full wave solver to, to calculate the loop inductance with the full wave solver. This is, this is the touchstone file I have here. So this has been calculated by the full wave solver here. And you see that the, the impedance agrees very nicely in the three setups but it's wrong if you do not include the mutual inductance. So that's very important because if you just calculate the straight sections with the partial solver and use them without the mutual inductance, it will give you not correct results. So we have for sure now grouped this three. So the straight wire has the highest inductance, uh, then it's the large loop, then it's the small loop. And what, of course, becomes difficult now when we go back to the quiz is to evaluate the inductance of the, let's go here, to evaluate the inductance of this conductor setup. People, when I saw the answers, people always were thinking like that A has the highest inductance simply because it's a, it, it's formed like an inductor. So you, you tend to have, you tend to think that the inductance increases, but actually, just because you formed the loop like this and you keep air inside, you're not putting any ferrite inside, you, you formed the loop like this, you are not increasing the magnetic energy which can be stored in, in this conductor setup. You're just concentrating it, so you have locally a more highest field. But the integral, the magnetic energy which is stored in the whole setup, it does not change. So what matters for the inductance of the coil is actually, again, the loop area and now it becomes pretty difficult to to guess what is the loop area because the arrangement is pretty complex it will be something like these two wires and then like some the center of the coil and this is the area which is enclosed now which we use for the inductance calculation but again it's pretty it's not straightforward to guess it so it might be like that uh, a is smaller than C or A is larger than C. It, was, it wasn't that easy to see. If you run the 3D calculation, you will see that actually A in this case, so let's go here, we have the uh, narrow white straight wire. And if we look at the coil, it falls in between this two, uh, it falls between the small, uh, the narrow loop and the wide loop. But this is just of the setup of the end conductors. Actually, if I take the coil and instead of connecting the coil like here, I calculate a partial 
inductance of having the the coil uh, terminals pointed away from this i changing now the loop area and if we do this way actually then the inductance of the straight coil let's do again narrow wide straight wire coil loop and inductance of the straight coil so this is the coil which connects to the outside it's becoming very similar already to the inductance of the large loop so for this more complex conductor setup it's really not that easy to guess so i think guessing the position of a was very difficult however guessing the the position or the size of the inductance of b d and c that you can get easily from physical considerations like for a conductor setup like a it's worse to use a full way uh, it's worse to use a 3d solution you could use both you could use a full wave approach here or you can do a partial approach for the coil loop while for the straight coil again because the, the wires are not connected to each other here this is something which can only be calculated with a partial inductance solver so that's it about the quiz i hope i could explain well while the inductance value are, are like this i hope you have enjoyed it up to the next time bye bye